Hey guys, John Grimsmo here. Got a funny little lathe story for you guys. So I've got a Nakamura AS200L. I started it up this morning, made my first part, and normally there's a spring-loaded ejector that ejects it out of the sub-spindle and into my pill bottle. But after the first part, I looked at it and it was still in there. And I'm like, well, where's the ejector pin? Is it stuck or something? Well, check this out. I took the collet out. Way in the back there, about three feet back or more, is my ejector body. So somehow, it's normally screwed into the back of a collet. Somehow it had unscrewed itself. I don't always put it super tight because it gets stuck otherwise. So somehow it had unscrewed itself and just traveled all the way back here. So either I reached something way long down in there, which is not very big and easy to do. Uh, a magnet might actually work. Oh, that's the best idea. I should do that. I can't fit a long rod in here because I can only fit between spindles unless I take out this collet and then I can fit a long bar like this one specifically. Stick a magnet on the end, shove it down, pull it back. Or, I just realized this idea. Or what I was going to do, which I already started, take off the panels, uh, front and side, which allows me access to that guy. This is the back of the sub spindle right there. I already took the retaining ring off right there. And then if I take this plug out, a little bit of coolant's gonna fall. And there it is. Got it. That's hilarious. Never had that problem. So now I just put the plug back in. So you have access on the machine on this side for if you want to put uh, super long bars to come out, although my chip conveyor is kind of in the way. Um, or, I don't know, I, I think some people um, will transfer parts out this side of the machine, maybe they're super long or something, so that the part can come out this way if it can't come out the uh, enclosure in the middle. But I'm glad I got this thing out. The magnet idea might have been a little bit easier than taking all these panels off, but I didn't realize that until I started filming. That's funny. But now I should be good to go. Let's put it back together and make some parts. In the seven months that I've had this lathe, that's the first time I've had to get into that side of it. Um, I do a similar thing all the time. On the main spindle side, this is where you'll put in a, a round bar of material. I've got a spindle liner in here, which looks about like this guy. That allows you to take a long skinny rod and have it be supported because otherwise the bore of the lathe is this big and then the rod will bow and cause all kinds of problems. So these spindle liners are pretty sweet. I bought this one from JF, JF Burns. Um, they're great, they're kind of expensive. So for the next ones I've got, I bought all these pucks of metal that are gonna become yay because I can make them. So it's one of those catch-22s, like, is it worth my time? You know, these are a hundred, hundred fifty dollars, something like that. Is it worth saving the hundred and fifty dollars in cash, still having to buy the material and then spending the hour, two hours, whatever it's gonna take me? You know, I'm on Grimsmo time, so I think, oh, it'll take 30 minutes, yeah, an hour and a half, two hours later. Um, I have to be very conscious of those things because I could put that two hours towards something more productive, more profitable, but I bought the material. It's a fun project. I don't know if I'll ever get around to it, but I do need to make some other uh, size collets or bar liners. Yeah. So here is my ejector that disappeared. Pretty simple device made by a hardinge. And you've got these replaceable um, pin bodies here. I've got some more various sizes. 
you buy them about this big and then I can turn them down to like that to clear my tiny little screws you know if I'm holding this part that's what I'm making today um, so basically threads into the back of the 5c call it and there's your pin so that as you come in and grab your part the spring contracts or compresses and then your call it squishes holds onto your part and then the part is under spring tension so when the second that this uh lets go it shoots the part i'll put this back together we'll make one and then i'll show you what it looks like so i've got this guy I forget if it came with the collets or if i bought it i can't remember to kind of grab onto the collet as you tighten it but this is super awkward so i had two of these i unbolted it from here and i mounted it solidly to my table so that as i tighten it now i can just put this guy on here done take a wrench tighten much easier get a better much better leverage with it too and here you can see an end mill that i uh, made a mistake on yesterday and i crashed it stupid mistake These are Royal um, 5C collet noses for the lathe. Um, with the good hardinge collets, see how it's got one slit here, and that helps align it. Now on the hardinge ones, the quality collets, that slit always aligns with the D in the word hardinge that's laser engraved into the face there. And there's a set screw here that has to match up to that slot. So as I'm threading it in here, put that guy away as I'm threading this in I need to align it so that that slot aligns to there now with the hardinge one you just look at the engraving and you go until the D is there but this happens to be a cheap one uh, so there's no real good alignment so I often if you can see I scratch a line just I take a piece of carbide and I just scriggle squiggle a line on there um, that tells me where the top dead center is. It's car terminology. Um, because as you thread it in farther, it gets farther away. And this lathe has to be so accurate, it has to know exactly how far everything sticks out, otherwise you're gonna crash, which I've done a few times. Um, so if I screw this in all the way, my top dead center is here, but it needs to be here. And I'm not gonna force it, so I need to unscrew it three quarters of a turn in order to get my four millimeter, I believe it is in there into the set screw and then I kind of wiggle it this is a two-hand operation there we go and then I've got it tight just snug take that out take that out there I drilled some holes in my table because I always use these things so they're always right there I like that and then the uh, cap screw goes back in Tight. Put that back in. Um, so imagine if this was unscrewed one one rotation more, you would be farther out. Now when I machine this part, I'm going within thousands of this face. Notice how it's flat because I accidentally hit it a couple times. Uh, now the flatness works really good for me actually, but yeah. So I, it, having this accuracy stuff like this should really be written down in a setup sheet. Or like uh, in the code, you know, sometimes I'll first see threading takes 61 seconds, checks torque fit, check torques fit often, things like that. Like notes to yourself is super duper handy all the time. Um, yeah, so let's make a part. With the coolant, you can't see what, what is going on. So let's see if we have any 3 8 brass. Quarter brass, there we go, 3 8 brass. So we can make, uh, we'll make a part in brass and that way we don't need coolant, you can see what's going on. Good to go. 
So one of my little notes to myself, pull out 0 0.350, got my calipers, put the brass in, got my foot pedal here, which tightens the collet. And then, this is, I, I feel stupid sharing this, but this is something I only learned a few months ago. I used to go like, like this to measure it, or like this, you know, to measure stick out. I, I feel really dumb about this. But the step right here to here, see how that kind of perfectly works? And obviously, when it's closed, it matches up. And this is now how I do it. I saw um, one of my applications engineers came in to train me on the machine and he did it like this. And I was like, wait, 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 what are you doing? What is that? I've never seen that before. So I feel dumb, but when you're self-taught, you just don't know everything. You haven't seen the experienced guy do it. Uh, and little things like that, they're so subtle, but sometimes you just don't figure it out on your own. So I go in, 350. I'm a little lax on this. I went too far. Too far again. There we go. 355, I'm fine with that. Put this guy back. So here I come in and I do my rough turning and I move down in Y and I use the other tool for some finish turning. Nice and slow, get a good surface finish. And then I'm going to switch to a thread milling tool, a single point thread mill tool. And I'm doing C axis thread milling. But instead of rotating around the part, I'm rotating the part itself and just pulling back on the z-axis to cut the threads as the thread mill is spinning at 6,000 RPM and everything is timed and pitched perfectly. And sometimes I'll do a few passes on this, especially in stainless. And that guy retracts, the parting tool, some spindle comes in and grabs it, pulls it out the exact amount, parts it off. So from this point, it is now in the sub-spindle, tensioned by that ejector pin. You can see how little is sticking out. And then I come in with the facing tool, the turning tool, which is up there. Uh, and then I skim it, do a facing pass, I drill it, I mill the torques, I chamfer it, I check the torques, and then I eject it. Now, I'm not going to do that with the brass part, at least not without coolant, because I have a Hymatech speeder here, which is a 3 to 1 speeder. So normally I get 6,000 RPM for my live tools. This is a 3 to 1, gives me 18,000 RPM for my tiny little 20,000 end mill here. And that really helps uh, make this tool last longer, cut the part faster and uh, makes my torque seize nicer. But you cannot run this without coolant. They won't let you, they'll void the warranty, and it's a terrible idea. So I have to run this with coolant to keep it cool because it generates a lot of heat. It's a gear-driven speeder. So not only do I have coolant coming through it there, but I also have auxiliary coolant spraying the outside to keep the case of it cool. Uh, so maybe I'll run it anyway with the coolant on, but you can't see what's going on. All right, we'll leave the coolant off just for a second, we have M1 optional stop activated. Means it'll stop on every M1. We're gonna go down, hit cycle start. She's a zippy little machine. One more. Drill that hole. I'm using an end mill to drill the hole. See, little drill hole. Now we're gonna turn the coolant on because we need it. Car wash. So right now the uh, C2 axis, the subspindle C axis, rotational, is, is locked. 
And you can see here C2 is selected. Uh, so that's locked and indexed, so it's at exactly zero degrees. So that um, the all the torques is line up. The torques milling, the torques engraving, everything else. If we go to custom one, condition, we can see last time 131 seconds, we're at 86 right now, so you see how long is left. And here's where you have some pretty cool total count, preset count, work workpiece count. So I, if I want to make 15, I've already made two. Last part took 610 because I stalled a little bit. It's usually about 510. Cycle time. Today it's been on for 30 minutes. Yesterday I had it on for seven hours and I made four hours and 25 parts, which is pretty good. Well, I mean, it could be better, but... Here we go, we're coming up on our time. Now the um, chamfer mill is in there. favorite parts. Optional stop. I'm going to turn the everything down so it's slow. Coolant is off. It even rotates the turret slowly. Alright, so here I have hard mounted a Torx bit, a T9 Torx bit. Aligned perfectly. So it's going to go in here. I'm just going really slow right now. going to go into the hole. It's feeding in with uh, load sensing enabled. It didn't see any resistance, so it's pulling back safely. And then it's speeding out. So what that does, it allows me to know if my tiny little end mill broke, that Torx bit is not going to fit into the hole. It's going to sense the load. It's going to stop immediately and alarm out. That way I'm not making bad parts, which works really, really awesome. And then the next step is to pull the pill bottle. Okay, but I'm gonna stop it early. I hit feed hold. I'm gonna hit the uh, foot pedal here to release the thing. You can see the spring load. Boink. And there's my part. And if I let this go, crank it up. Release, retract, good to go. Notice how the chamfer just captures the light and glints off it. That chamfer is actually a little bit bigger than I normally like. It's fine. I might take it down by a thou. You don't get a chamfer with a rotary broached hole. And you don't get such a beautiful flat bottom. But yeah. So that is what goes into making just one of the many, many, many parts that we make on our knives. A lot of love, a lot of dedication, a lot of headache and hassle. But you know what? We love it. I love doing this. This is so much fun. And I love sharing it when I can. And I love this machine. It's amazing. It's complicated and frustrating and exciting all at the same time. And when it's running smooth and fast, it is very exciting. Thanks for watching, guys.